I come from New York. I come from ground zero, September 11th, 2001. Democracy Now! broadcast at that time at 9 o'clock in the morning. The first plane hit the first tower of the World Trade Center at 847. We didn't know what happened. We were just blocks from there. We're in the garret of an old century old firehouse that has now been converted into a community media center where people learn how to do video and documentaries documenting their own communities. So it's serving the community in a different way. But 847, the first plane hit. We didn't know what happened. Second plane hits at 903. We had gone on the air at 9 o'clock. We heard something, but still didn't distinguish it from just the soundscape of New York, and we just kept broadcasting. That day, we were doing a program on the significance of September 11th, 1973, when Salvador Allende, the democratically elected president of Chile, died in the palace as the Kissinger-Nixon-backed Pinochet regime rose to power, killing thousands of Chileans. And so on September 11, 2001, we were doing a program on the importance of September 11th and how it represented terror for another population, for the people of Chile. There were, on that day, more documents that had been declassified, further implicating Henry Kissinger, and that's what we were looking at. And then we started to realize what was unfolding and just kept reporting through the day and linked up with KPFA here uh, in the Bay Area and did a joint broadcast. Uh, we were bringing people who were just stumbling from the rubble. Still, no one quite understanding what was happening, just explaining what they had experienced. And we stayed at the firehouse for the next days because we were in the evacuation zone. And we knew that if we stepped out, the National Guard or the police or the military would throw us out. And we knew we had a responsibility to broadcast because already we saw that the war machine was gearing up in Washington and it was our responsibility to bring out all the voices, the amazing voices of people who were in the midst of the worst grief of their lives, having lost loved ones at the World Trade Center, but fully understood how this was going to be used and wanted to try to put a stop to that. People, people like Rita Lassar, 70 years old, who lost her brother Abe Zalmanowitz on the 27th floor of the World Trade Center. Rita is the mother of Matthew Lassar, who comes from this area, who wrote The Rise of an Alternative Network about the history of Pacifica Radio. It was his uncle that died on that day. Abe Zalmanowicz was on the 27th floor, and he refused to leave until the emergency workers made it up to save his friend Ed, who is a paraplegic who works next to him. Well, they went down with so many others. They went down with 3,000 other people. Though we will never know how many people actually died on that day, because those who go uncounted in life go uncounted in death, and they are the undocumented workers who worked and lived in and around the World Trade Center, whose families still to this day afraid to step forward, to name their loved ones, afraid because of the close relationship between the immigration authorities in this country and the police, afraid that they could be, like thousands of other immigrants in this country, detained themselves or deported. Just this past September 10th, on the eve of the anniversary of September 11th, I walked with Talat and Mohammed Hamdani, a Pakistani couple who lost their son, Mohammed Salman Hamdani, on September 11th. He was a police cadet. He wasn't at the World Trade Center. But when he heard what was happening, he was working at Rockefeller University. He raced over. And he died on that day, trying to save people. And they were remembering him walking down to ground zero with the procession of people. And I was following them and talking to them. As they tried to find their son, the New York Post came out with a story. It said, missing, disappeared, killed, or hiding. 
And what they tried to put forward was that he was one of the terrorists. And soon everyone in the neighborhood was terrified. Was he the terrorist? When he was a young police cadet who certainly did not have to go to ground zero, but he did because he wanted to save someone. He wanted to help. Talat Hamdani, his mother, said that when they went from hospital to hospital, they got scared. They got scared to say that their son's name was Mohammed. And so they said it was Sal for Salman. They went from hospital to hospital, and they looked for him, and they couldn't find him. And Talat is a teacher. And she said she started to find in her classes that the young Arab children, Arab Americans, were changing their names like they were changing their son's name. Muhammad was becoming Marty. And the girls as well, afraid. What has this country become for certain populations right now? For Arab Americans, for Muslims, for people of South Asian descent. It has become a very frightening place. For some, this is no question the greatest democracy on earth. But for others, it is becoming like it was more than 50 years ago for Japanese Americans. I was recently in Santa Fe where there is a marker for 4,555 Japanese Americans who were interned in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and of course in California and in Washington State. We're talking about more than 100,000 people. Now this country has acknowledged that was wrong and even paid some minimal compensation. And yet what is happening today? Tens of thousands of people have been detained. Faisal Ulvi is a person we had on Democracy Now! Maybe some of you heard his story. Maybe some of you first heard when we had Nadine, his wife, who was absolutely hysterical after Faisal was taken, the day after Election Day last year. They were at home. They had three kids, nine and four and one and a half. It was 6.30 in the morning. Nadine and her daughter, who was four, taking a shower. Faisal was in bed and the two boys were getting ready, and the nine-year-old was getting ready for school. Suddenly the door was forced in downstairs. They made it into the apartment. It was the authorities. It was the feds. It was the FBI. It was the New York police. Nadine didn't know what to do. She was in the bathroom. She asked if she could get her clothes. They said no. She's an American citizen. She put on her husband's jeans that were in the bathroom. She put a towel over her top. And she came out and said, what are you doing, as they started to take Faisal Ulvi out, her husband. She said, what are you doing? They said, you keep out of this. This is none of your business. She said, none of your business. This is my husband. The kids were terrorized, seeing their husband being dragged out, their father being dragged out by armed men. They took him away. She didn't know where. She didn't know what to do. But she fortunately went to an immigrant advocacy group and they got her a lawyer and that's often not the case that someone can get a lawyer and she tracked him to New Jersey he called her a week later and said Nadine I think I'm going to be deported they've put me in civilian clothes they've shackled me I'm going off with a bunch of other men Nadine desperately called the lawyer they raced off in the middle of the night how many families can afford to do this who have children pouring rain 3 30 in the morning she races to New Jersey as her lawyer said who was racing there as well when the bus came pulled up next to the detention center it said immigration and naturalization service at 3 30 in the morning she said if this is okay why are they doing it under cover of darkness and they started to take the men out one by one dozens of them. These were men who were going to be part of another secret airlift. Yes, this is America, to Pakistan. And as they were being dragged out, Nadine was hysterical. The lawyer was desperately trying to stop this, saying, you've made a mistake. He is married to an American citizen going through the proper process. He is not supposed to be deported. 
They said, if you come near this bus, you will simply be arrested. And so they drove home Nadine to call any politician she could, and Elizabeth Uyang, the lawyer, trying to go to a judge, find a judge who would stop this. She was finally able to reach a deportation guard who said yes, that Faisal was going to be deported at 11.30 that morning. Somehow she got this man's cell phone number. She raced off to court. And in the court, she found a judge who stayed the deportation. And Elizabeth then said, the lawyer, Elizabeth Uyang, what do we do? How do I let them know they've stayed it? He's on the tarmac. He's at the airport. Where do I fax this to? And then she remembered she had the cell phone number of the guard. And so she raced off to call, and she couldn't reach the guard, and she kept calling. She was down the hall now as the judge went on to another case, and suddenly she was able to get through. And she started racing down the hall to the courtroom, and a guard came after her saying, no cell phones in this courthouse. <laughs> and she said, I can't even talk. And she just ran into the courtroom, followed by the guard running in, and she is holding up her cell phone, and the judge looks. She comes off of the bench, and she takes the phone, and she says, this is Judge Rohan. I want you to release Faisal Ulvi right now. And so the deportation guard takes Faisal from the group of men. And instead of 88 men deported to Pakistan that day, 87 men were deported to Pakistan. I don't know if you can call that a victory in the larger picture, but certainly for the Ulvis, it was. And now Faisal and Nadine and their ch three children are going through the procedure that so many immigrants in this country have gone through. When I went to Coney Island Project, the immigrant advocacy group, because they were having a protest, and I was looking at all of these signs in Arabic of more than 100 people who were protesting deportations in Brooklyn, I realized where I was. This is where my father had grown up. Right around the corner, there was the Orthodox Jewish community, and there was the Arabic community. We were all in this together, only in my family's case, it was several generations ago. My grandparents came over from Russia and Poland, and thank goodness that they were welcomed here in this country to flee the persecution they faced, the pogroms that they faced. And now here I was, my grandparents' granddaughter, my great-grandfather, a Hasidic rabbi, my other grandfather, an Orthodox rabbi. And I was standing there with this group of Arabic men and women, Arab men and women, holding up signs that I couldn't read as they were talking about their plight today. We are all in this together. What has happened, what happened on 2000, in 2001 united us all. On that day, September 11, 2001, yes, people in this country understood terror very well. 3,000 people incinerated in a moment. But it was not the first time terror came to U.S. shores. Paid for by our tax money. Just ask Ida B. Wells, who fought lynching for so many years. Just ask any African American about slavery. Certainly that was terror. Ask any Native American who have known terror in this country for centuries. But it was a horrific day. It was a day that united us with September 11th through history in different places. September 11th, 1973, 30 years ago in Chile, thousands of people killed over the years under Pinochet. September 11th, 1990, the Guatemalan anthropologist Myrna Mack was killed by U.S.-backed security forces. September 11th, 1990. September 11th, 1977 in South Africa, Steve Biko, the founder of the Black Consciousness Movement was being beaten to death by U.S.-backed apartheid forces and died in the early morning of September 12th. And September 11th, 1971, in New York, upstate Attica, 
from September 8th to September 13th, when the men rose up against the prison conditions at Attica, and then Governor Rockefeller called in the state troopers, and they opened fire on the prisoners, killing 39 men and wounding more than 80 others. Yes, we have known terror over these decades, all over the world. And on September 11, 2001, we knew it once again. I was talking about Rita Lassar, whose brother went down on September 11th. A few days later, George Bush gave a speech at the National Cathedral, and she invo he invoked the story of Abe Zalmanowitz, and Rita said no. She understood what her brother was being used for, and she wrote a letter to the New York Times, and it actually appeared. And it said, it pleaded with George Bush, and it said that, and Rita has repeated this over and over, that even as she knew the worst grief of her life, it would only increase her suffering to know that a sister in Afghanistan would soon lose her brother. And then there was Greg and there was Orlando and Phyllis Rodriguez, who lost their son Greg Ernesto Rodriguez above the hundredth floor of the World Trade Center. He was working for Cantor Fitzgerald. 600 of 1,000 workers died on September 11th above the hundredth floor at Cantor Fitzgerald. And as they hunkered down with their family remembering Greg, they too wrote a letter. It didn't get published anywhere, but it swirled around the internet. And they said it would only increase their suffering to know that soon a mother and father in Afghanistan would know their pain, might lose their son. They said, like Rita said, no, not in our name, not in our son's name. And they were part of a nationwide movement, not in our name. Peacefultomorrows.org, September 11th families opposed to war. In those first few days, when we stayed at the firehouse and just kept broadcasting the voices of these people who had lost loved ones but were saying no to war, I watched as those pictures went up all over New York City, on every fire pole, on every hospital wall, all over New York, the Xeroxes of color photographs of people lost at the World Trade Center. Union Square was filled with a thousand pictures People from every walk of life, every age. You would have a mother holding her child and it would say, last seen above the 77th floor of the World Trade Center, if you see my wife, please call me. And it would give a phone number. Or a picture of a young man and it would say, say if you've seen my son, please call me. A father waiting and it would give a number. And I thought about how similar those pictures were to those pictures on the placards that the mothers of the disappeared held in Argentina as they walked through the Plaza de Mayo. Pictures that said, have you seen my son? Have you seen my granddaughter? As these women looked for their children and their grandchildren who were lost in Argentina's dirty war, generals backed by the US. All too often the terror people in other countries have known have been as a result of military governments that have been supported by our government. The United States is better than that. We can represent good in the world. September 11, 2001, a horrific moment a few days later, Bush came to ground zero and a chant went up around him, USA, USA. That is not the answer. The answer is a global community united against terror. And in order to rout out terror, we have to have a universal standard of justice, as represented, for example, by the International Criminal Court that was established by countries around the world. The Pentagon has long fought it. 
Clinton signed on to it only on the last day he possibly could, and then Bush came into office and unsigned the treaty, as he unsigned or refuses to sign so many others. Why? I think Henry Kissinger knows the answer. It's to protect people like him. That's right. I think Osama bin Laden and his allies should be tried for what happened on September 11th. But I also think that Henry Kissinger should be tried. He should be tried. He should be tried for the people of Chile who lost their lives. He should be tried for the people of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. How many people are we talking about? Two, three, four million people? He should be tried for the people of East Timor. The day before Indonesia invaded East Timor, the day before December 7, 1975, Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, together with President Ford, went to Indonesia, met with the long-reigning dictator Suharto, and gave the go-ahead for Indonesia's invasion of Timor. Ninety percent of the weapons were used were from the United States. And what happened next was one of the worst genocides of the 20th century. And as Kissinger came back to the United States a few days after the invasion began, he was getting cables from high-level State Department officials saying, this invasion is very bloody. We're not going to be able to justify it before Congress. They're going to cut off military aid to Indonesia for engaging in this offensive act. Did he thank them for the information they brought him? No. When he came back to Washington, he called a high-level meeting of State Department officials who had written the cable, and he castigated them for leaving a paper trail. He said, we will not kick our ally in the teeth. And that allowed Indonesia to close East Timor to the outside world and start to kill hundreds, then thousands, then tens of thousands, then hundreds of thousands of Timorese, an army that was trained, financed, armed by the United States. So I do think that Henry Kissinger should be tried in an international tri tribunal, the International Criminal Court. And that would show the world that we do believe in justice that we do believe that there is a standard, there is a line which, that no U.S. official, no U.S. soldier, or any other person in the world can cross. And if they do, they will be held accountable. It's precisely why the Bush administration now is trying to force country after country to sign bilateral agreements to say that they will not hold U.S. officials and U.S. soldiers accountable in such a court. Fine for all of them to do, but not fine for us. Well, that makes people angry. And we have suffered that wrath as they have suffered U.S. foreign policy. But I do think that we can take control of that foreign policy. This is an absolutely critical year. This is an election year. Hopefully not a selection year. <laughs> you know, like happened in 2000, President Select Bush. It's hard to even call him President. We'll call him the resident of the White House. <laughs> but, what he has going for him is the money right now. He is raising a fortune. He is raising a battle chest of money. He is going from one fundraiser to another as the body count in Iraq increases. Both U.S. soldiers, now over 400 dead, Iraqis we don't even know. We're talking probably over 10,000 Iraqis killed. As General Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, has said, we don't count the enemy dead. Well, I don't consider a little girl or boy killed by a U.S. bomb my enemy. And I don't think most people in this country do. We 
see those pictures of the target on Saddam Hussein's head, it would be more accurate to show that target on the head of a little girl or boy, because that's who dies in war. The overwhelming number of people who die are innocent civilians. We've got to take on the institutions that feed this war machine, that defend it, that protect it. And I think the most powerful of those institutions is the media. That is why we need an independent media in this country and why we must challenge the corporate media that has spewed the lies for the Bush administration for more than a year. But let's just look at this year and what it has meant. You know, the New York Times did this big display or this five-page spread on that young reporter, Jason Blair, who conned them, who, you know, played, who uh, fabricated stories. And we read all about it in the New York Times. Yes, I think he should have been fired. And the Times said that they had reached an all-time low in their 152-year history in their reporting. I agree. But not because of the Jason Blair affair, because of the Bush Blair affair. And that Bush Blair affair counts a great deal more. Let's look at just this last year, what the Times did. First, you have the Bush administration, and we all remember it. I was actually here. It was 2002. Michael Franti was having his Power to the Peaceful rally in San Francisco. 20,000 people were out. And I was there. Medea Benjamin came up to me and said, did you hear what Andrew Card said, the chief of staff? When asked why, where was Bush through August, you know, all the stuff was mounting against the Bush administration, but they weren't countering any of the stuff coming out showing Iraq wasn't connected to 911. Where was Bush? In? And what did Andrew Card say? From a marketing point of view, you don't roll out a new product in August. Andrew Card, the former GM lobbyist, right? The oily garky has ascended in Washington. You have Bush, the failed oil man, Cheney, former head of the largest oil services corporation in the world, still on their payroll as Halliburton. Well, what did, I hate to quote him, but what did David Letterman say? Bush, when you write out that $87 billion check, remember Halliburton has two L's? <laughs> so you have Cheney, oil man, Bush oil man, Condoleezza Rice has an oil tanker name for her, a Chevron oil tanker. They had to take it off about a year ago because it was getting some adverse publicity. <laughs> Chevron headquartered right here in San Francisco, largest oil corporation headquartered in California. She was, the ch she was on the board of directors for more than a decade. 1991 to 2001, January 15th, when she became National Security Advisor, all through that period where, Niger where Chevron was having to deal with um, the adverse publicity of Chevron in Nigeria, opening, bringing in the Nigerian military and the mobile police, the kill and go, to an another protest of people who are protesting yet another oil spill and the military opened fire on the protesters killing two, critically wounding a third and rounding up the others, putting them in the notorious Nigerian jails. Condoleezza Rice was on the board of directors of Chevron all through that time. She most recently has talked about how proud she is of what Chevron has accomplished. So yes, the oily garky is in power and we see what the repercussions of that are. But you've got the media's coverage, Andrew Card saying we're going to roll out the new product in September, and then it happened. Blair and Bush, now they're together again on the other side of the ocean. But September 2002, they're at Camp David, and they announce that the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, has come out with a report saying that, you know, Saddam is just about to get nuclear weapons. Only problem was IAEA never put out such a report. And none of the media 
challenge them on that. That was the beginning, and that was very important, that image of a mushroom cloud, how many Congress members cited it when they voted for war. Yes, that scares America. The idea of this tyrant, US-backed, of course, Rumsfeld knows he was sent by Reagan and Bush in 1983 and 4 to normalize relations with Bush when he'd already gassed Iranians. But here, this tyrant who could get a hold of nuclear weapons and use them against his own people, but perhaps against us, yes, that was frightening, but it was all a lie. And the next week, Cheney going on Meet the Press with Tim Russert and saying that he's got aluminum tubes now that shows he's developing a nuclear program, nuclear weapons. And he says, but, you know, don't believe me. And he holds up the New York Times, that front page piece, Judith Miller piece, talking about aluminum tubes, and it says, and he says, attribute it here properly to the New York Times. Of course, she's citing unnamed sources, which are Cheney's White House. <laughs> and the product is being rolled out, and the Pentagon can't do it alone. They need the media, and the media is doing it for them. And the New York Times dutifully, Judith Miller, article after article, front page, unnamed sources. Now it turns out, based on the INC, the uh, Iraq National Congress, Ahmed Chalabi, who had a vested interest in putting out these lies, the Times has never retracted these lies over this year. And then the most recent, one of the more recent pieces, there's Judith Miller. And what does it say? Syria has weapons of mass destruction. And you go, my God, it's happening all over again. The problem is these lies take lives. These lies take lives. And we have to hold the mainstream media accountable. When you have MSNBC, not just Fox, and NBC, and CNN calling their coverage Operation Iraqi Freedom, the same thing, the same name that the Pentagon carefully researched for its propagandistic value, when they call it the name that the Pentagon calls it, you have to ask, if we had state media in this country, how would it be any different? And then you have more than 600 reporters in bed with, I mean embedded <laughs> with the troops. The only problem now, even as we criticize that, is that it makes it sound like the reporters are no longer embedded with the Pentagon or embedded in the White House or in the State Department. They continue to be. But this idea that the Pentagon has perfected, Victoria Clark, who was the Pentagon spokesperson, came from Hill & Knowlton, one of the most powerful PR firms in the world, was very proud of what they had accomplished embedding the troops in the front lines. What image do you get then? What story? One story. It's called the Stockholm Syndrome. When it's not really being held hostage because these reporters identify with. Their lies, lives are in the hands of these troops. And so of course we're only getting one perspective. If you're going to have troops embedded or reporters embedded in the troops, what about reporters embedded at the target end? What about reporters embedded in Iraqi communities? What about reporters embedded in peace movements around the world to give us a sense of how the world is responding? And these are not just private corporations that get to do what they want. These private corporations are using the public airwaves just like Pacifica Radio. And they have a responsibility to tell the truth. They have a responsibility to provide a forum for a full diversity of opinion. I've been here before and I've talked about my experience on the Sally Jesse Raphael show. How many of you <laughs> ever heard me talk about it? Well, I'll just very quickly recount it because I think it illustrates this point. During the Persian Gulf War, as I was on WBAI, where I come from in New York, right, Pacifica's five stations here at KPFA, Los Angeles KPFK, Washington WPFW, Houston KPFT, and WBAI in New York. I was railing against the bombing of, cradle, the, bombing of the cradle of civilization back to the cradle 
during the Persian Gulf War. And it was during fundraising drive, and someone ran in and said, I was on the air, the Sally Jesse Raphael show is on the phone. And you know, all sorts of people come in to volunteer. So I said, yeah, right. And I just kept on talking and they came back and they said, no, really, really. It's please come to the phone. So I picked up the phone to please them. And there was a producer from the Sally Jesse Raphael show. She said she was listening in her limousine. I guess the chauffeur had turned on the program. <laughs> And she said, would you like to join us on the show in a few days? We want to do a show on the Gulf War, three women for the war, three women against. And I said, sure. So I went over to the Sally Jesse Raphael show. Wasn't sure what to wear, whether to dress as a man, dressed as a woman, dressed as a man, dressed as a woman, dressed as a man. <laughs> but I figured it out and went over, and this crusading producer said, please make this lively, we want to make this show count, to show her that you, we can do a program that has meaning, and it will still have ratings. And so we went out onto the stage, it was actually me and five military women, three military women for the war, and two opposed, along with me. And the show started, and Sally went to someone in the audience with her microphone, and that person said, I'm really concerned about Saddam Hussein's biological and chemical weapons. And the woman who was sitting next to me was named Dr. Yolanda Hewitt Vaughn. She was an army captain who was refusing to go to the Gulf, saying she was trained to, take, to save lives, not take them. And she was about to be court-martialed. But there she was sitting next to me, very quiet, mild-mannered person. Um, and she said, well, I think you have a right to be concerned, but you should also be concerned about the chemical and biological weapons right here in the United... And before she could finish her sentence, Sally had whirled around, came storming down the aisle, started to shout, you be quiet, you be quiet, you shut up, this is my show. Now, I had not watched this program very much. We now know like about Jerry Springer and all of that, but I thought she was gonna strike Dr. Yolanda Hewitt Vaughn. So as she's coming up on the stage, I say, whoa, Sally, back off. <laughs> and, and she is shaking and she stops the taping of the show. Meanwhile, the producers had had each of us, we could invite friends, and I had brought people from BAI, so they're already chanting, free speech, free speech. <laughs> Mario would have been very proud. And they're chanting, censorship, censorship. And Sally is shaking in the middle of the audience, right in front of us, and her producers come out and start to rock her back and forth, and they say, it's okay, Sally. It's okay. <laughs> I mean, this is one moment where the three of us women opposed to the war were together with the three women who were for war, all of us looking in absolute shock. <laughs> and, I mean, I think these people are so insulated that it really does shock them to hear a different point of view. And they convinced her to continue with the taping of the show. You know, it's sent out like a day later, and that's when the rest of the um, country airs it. They continued, they, they convinced her. And so the show continued. And we had a very robust discussion. Oh, well, she did say, before we started, that we would have to raise our hands if we had anything to say. The guests, the guests. So I had never seen this except on Sesame Street when the guests <laughs> raised their hands and she would call on us. But we agreed and the show went on. Now, she showed video of the protesters in Washington and she said, Miss Goodman, I would like you to explain who those people are. <laughs> so I, con I said, oh, you mean Joe and Mary? No, no. I said, I said, first, Sally, I want to congratulate you. I want to congratulate you for not only showing the images of people protesting in the streets, but actually inviting them some, some of them into the studio. Because most Americans do not identify with 10,000 people screaming in the streets. 
But why do they do that? They do it because they are not invited, like Henry Kissinger, into a studio so they can speak calmly into a mic and explain what their point of view is. They can only hope that if they scream very loud, that perhaps on a global warming day, a CBS executive will open his window. <laughs> and that sound of no war will waft into CBS's studios and perhaps hit an open mic. Um, but, but, so I congratulated her for bringing us in to have a civilized discussion. And then we went on and talked about all sorts of things. For example, I said that as the granddaughter of an Orthodox rabbi, it horrifies me to see little Israeli children wearing gas masks. But there is a more horrible image, and that is Palestinian children without gas masks. And that's how we talked for an hour. At the end of the show, we finished up, and we left. We walked off the stage, the cameraman gave me a thumbs up, and we left. And I went back to BAI and waited the next day and the next, and lots of people were calling, when's it going to be on, and the next day, and the next day, and I said, I don't know, call the Sally Jesse Raphael show, don't call me. And okay, so I went on the air and I gave their number, because we were being very bothered at BAI, and we said, don't swamp our switchboard, swamp theirs if you want to know why they're not um, broadcasting the show. And then I called, and I asked, what's up? And they said, oh, there was a problem with the sound. You see, there's audio, and there's video, and it wasn't synced properly. And so I said, yeah, I think there was a problem with the sound of our voices. And she said, don't be like that. <laughs> so she said that Chicago and Minneapolis had called. They had gotten the videos, and they said that there was this problem. So I called. I asked to speak to the operations director of each of the stations. I guess they're not very popular because I got right through. I said I was a concerned viewer. When would that show on war be aired? And both times they were surprised. And they said, well, that's odd because we haven't aired it yet. But it was just pulled from New York. We just got a call. And we're scrambling to fill in for this show we're not supposed to air. So I called and said, the jig is up. I know, you know that it really is because you are censoring this show. And people just kept calling. And I guess, well, I met a person a few years later who was a producer in an elevator. And she said, you know, you guys shut down the Sally Jesse Raphael show for two days. We could not function with the number of calls that came in. And then <laughs> when I originally called, I asked to speak to the executive producer. And they said, he is a very busy man. <laughs> so anyway, after they got these hundreds, perhaps thousands of calls, they called me. And they said, the executive producer would like to speak to you. And I said, I said, I'm a very busy woman. <laughs> so they said they were going into a high-level meeting. And they would decide what to do. But would I cry censorship? if they edited the program. I said, of course not. I'm an editor, too. You have a right to do that. I assume you'll edit out Sally's tantrum. Um, <laughs> and they did end up running that show the next day, but it ran with headlines around the country that said things like, things get messy with Sally Jesse. So it got even more attention. But most interestingly, after it ran, the response I got that was most interesting was women on southern military bases who called to say, I have never heard this point of view before, they said. One woman after another, saying either they were going to war or their loved ones, sons, husbands, relatives. And they said, we agree with you. And we don't have a chance on military bases to debate these issues. It is up to you in civil society. And that is why independent media, why all media is so important. That is the place where together, whether or not we know each other personally, we have a national discussion and debate. We decide whether these men and women will be sent to another country to kill or be killed. And if we don't have those discussions, we are doing a disservice to the service men and women of this country. And now, 
Now you have more than 400 soldiers have been killed. You know, right now, Bush is uniting people across the political spectrum against him. You've got the intelligence community that is enraged by the manipulation of intelligence, the lies that have been told about their work and their investigations. You've got military families. At Fort Stewart, Georgia recently, 700 military families confronted a military official. He had to be taken out by military security to protect him from the military families. And then you have Cheney, just this week, as yet another young woman is being buried at Arlington Cemetery. She was 43 years old. She had gone to Iraq as her last tour of duty, and she was going to retire. She was a reservist in Hawaii. She was flying back. She was taken down in that Chinook helicopter. So she's being buried at Arlington National Cemetery. And where is Cheney? Three fundraisers in New York. So there you have it, three fundraisers and a funeral. Bush and Cheney have not been to one funeral of one service man or woman who died in Afghanistan or Iraq. They are busy raising money for 2004. And they also want to ensure that none of us know that those funerals are taking place. They know the power of images of young men and women being brought home from the front lines. They know. And so they have enforced an executive order that no cameraman, no photographer can film at Dover Air Base in Delaware or Ramstein Base in Germany where the bodies of the dead soldiers come. And they've even erected curtains, I guess, for the wide-angle lenses or for the zooms to ensure that you cannot see. You know, it's interesting where this executive order came from. It came from, the per it came from George Bush Sr.'s administration. He's the first to have imposed it, although it never ended up being enforced. He imposed it after pa in Panama. He had had some kind of a backache or something during a press conference, and reporters asked him about it, and so he was joking around to show that he was okay, and he did a duck walk. At the same time, soldiers who'd been killed in Panama were being brought into, I believe it was Dover Air Force Base. And so the networks went to split screen, George Bush doing a duck walk, and the coffins coming home. And he got them back. He retaliated with this executive order that said that you cannot show these caskets coming home. Yes, we know the power of images. And it's not just of caskets. It's of girls in Vietnam who are burning with napalm, those photos can end wars. And that's why the mainstream media in this country is not showing them. We confronted Aaron Brown of CNN. We said, where are those pictures? You heard what he said. He said, it is tasteless. He said, when we asked, where are the anti-war voices? He said, not when the war is on. Now, I said, now what would happen? Do you think the Vietnam War would ever have ended if the media took that approach? And yet the media today is more locked down than it has ever been in terms of bringing out alternative information. In the week leading up to General Powell making his case at the UN Security Council and the week after, Fair looked at the four major nightly newscasts, NBC, ABC, CBS, and PBS's NewsHour with Jim Lehrer the four major nightly newscasts of 393 interviews on war. This was leading up to the war. Only three of the voices were anti-war representatives. Three of almost 400. The Pentagon has the most powerful weapon. It is the US media. And that must be challenged. Just as people march on the Pentagon and they march on armed forces recruiting stations in San Francisco and New York. In New York, it's, at the, it's in Times Square, not to be confused with the New York Times, which is just down the road. But it is not only the government institutions that must be challenged. It is the most powerful institutions on earth, and that is the media because they're not only among the wealthiest, but they are the 
lens through which we see each other and through which we are projected to the rest of the world. And it is a very frightening image, and it's an inaccurate one, because I believe that most people in this country are opposed to war. We're not a fringe minority, not a silent majority, but a silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. And that can stop, and we've seen the movement grow this year. When Michael Powell, son of Colin Powell, Michael Powell, chair of the FCC, tries a stealth move of changing rules to launch the largest media consolidation in this country's history. It seems so obscure, so arcane, why would anyone get involved with it? And yet by the end of this year, more than two million people wrote to Congress and to the FCC and said no, because people across the political spectrum have a gut reaction have a visceral response to the idea that someone like Rupert Murdoch will own the newspaper, the television, and the radio in one town. That is media locked down. And when people find out, they do something about it. That's the good news in this country. That's the good news of this year. This year that could change the world. That people are organizing. Whether it's the media and democracy movement challenging the FCC, Michael Powell knows what he's doing. His father leads the war in Iraq, and he leads the war on diversity of voices at home. One needs the other. But it's not only the media and democracy movement. It's also visit death row in Illinois. A conservative Republican governor, George Ryan, emptied death row in Illinois. It is absolutely remarkable. And it is not because of George Ryan, who is co-chair of Bush's 2000 election campaign in Illinois. It's because George Ryan read the Chicago Tribune, where two crusading reporters did the series of pieces on the racial disparities uh, in the death penalty, who gets put on death row and who doesn't. But it's not just because of these two guys who did a great job at the Chicago Tribune. They were inspired by students at Northwestern led by a crusading teacher named David Protus, who started to investigate the cases of men on death row. And they started to find the murderers in the streets and exonerate these guys on death row. Students, college students. And who were they inspired by? They were inspired by anti-death penalty activists who have so long worked and exposed the racism and inequality and inhumanity of the death penalty. And who were those death penalty activists inspired by? Well, I go think back 10 years in Illinois going for some conference and meeting with the mothers of the disappeared, the mothers of men on death row who would not stop. They kept saying that their sons were innocent. And then we learn about this police chief they were talking about, John Berg, who tortured these young men. You can see their words engraved in the metal benches of police stations saying, I confess, I'm not guilty, I am tortured. John Berg, who was able to retire from the Chicago Police Department, he should be in jail now. But those mothers never gave up. And now, George Ryan, the governor of Illinois, emptied death row. That is because of a movement, just as the FCC, Media and Democracy movement has had an enormous effect. I take hope from young activists all over this country and around the world, from the protesters here at Berkeley a year ago, it is so much easier not to have to leave your room or to just go hang out and drink or party. It is not easy to do this work. It is because people are committed and have principles and have to be honored for that. I take hope because in May 20th, 2002, I went back to East Timor with Alan Nairn after surviving the massacre of 1991 where we watched 250 Timorese gunned down most of you know that story because you have Pacifica Radio. I take hope because Pacifica Radio was won back because of people like you all over the country. And going back to Timor, May 20th, 2000, 
and two, we stood with 100,000 Timorese as they celebrated their independence after a quarter of a century of Indonesian occupation, facing a U.S. weapon in the hands of Indonesian soldiers, whole villages wiped out, mothers, fathers, children killed, a country closed to the outside world to allow the slaughter to take place. On May 20, 2002, after the people of East Timor voted for their independence, they stood together as Shanana Gushmao, the rebel leader of East Timor, ascended to the stage and raised the flag of the Democratic Republic of East Timor. And as the fireworks went up in the sands of Tasitolo outside of the capital of Dili, we looked at the faces of the Timorese who were looking up, their faces bathed in tears. We could see it in the light of the fireworks as they celebrated their new nation, this nation of survivors who've known so much pain, who've won their freedom at such a terrible price, but who nonetheless won their freedom. And they won it because of their persistence and their resilience and their determination and because they united, they had support from people all over the world who cared deeply about social justice and deeply that we could change the world, that we don't just have to represent one thing in this country, and that is the sword. All too often in other places in the world, they know us as that sword as providing weapons to brutal regimes around the world. But we can also represent something else, and people all over the world see that as well. They don't just see the U.S. government, they see the American people, and they see us representing a shield. And that's the decision that we have to make every day. And especially in this year, we can make that decision. What we want to represent to the rest of the world, yes, we're the number one superpower on Earth, but it does not have to be defined by military might. It should be defined by moral might. We can make the decision whether we want to represent the sword or the shield. Thanks very much.